Today at Knowledge at Wharton, we're speaking with Gary Gensler, and he's the chairman of the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. Thank you for joining us today, Gary. No, it's terrific to be back at my alma mater. Oh, great. Um, your career on Wall Street has not prevented you from being um, a target of criticism by your former Wall Street colleagues. And um, most of that is happening because of the way you would like to interpret the Dodd-Frank and other financial reforms. Um, now, your tenure comes to a close in just a couple of months at the end of 2013. And a lot of people would be sort of buffing up their plaques on the wall and starting to pack their boxes. But instead, you're actually involved in one of the most intense debates of your entire career at, at, at the commission. So um, you're also overseeing a market of derivatives that's somewhere between 400 and 600 or 700 trillion dollars. You can, you can fill us in on what the right number is. Um, could you talk about what this latest intense debate is about? I think it has to do with, with overseeing overseas derivatives and getting them or not getting them onto an exchange. Well, let me, let me start by saying uh, these uh, financial contracts called derivatives or swaps were at the center of the 2008 crisis, and uh, 8 million people lost their jobs in that crisis. And uh, large businesses like the insurance company AIG, uh, we Americans as taxpayers bailed out because it was so interconnected with the rest of the economy through the unregulated swaps marketplace. That's what this is about, ensuring uh, that there's transparency in the markets and ensuring that large financial firms have the freedom to fail uh, rather than uh, each of us Americans putting our hard-earned dollars in to bail out those businesses. Well, AIG, you might remember, had uh, a large swaps business which actually was run overseas. Their far-flung operations actually nearly brought down our U.S. economy. So this most recent debate about the cross-border application was to ensure that our laws are not strictly territorial, but they actually will cover the far-flung operations, the branches and guaranteed affiliates of U.S. financial institutions. And we've been successful. Congress gave us, gave us those authorities, and our commission voted out guidance in July to do that. That is um, it's a, it's a parallel situation to the banks and bank regulations, correct, where, where too big to fail is, uh, is it's, it's a problem in preventing that partly because uh, so many operations can be overseas. So you, you, you face that same problem. You have, as I understand it, overseas uh, regulators uh, or certainly uh, financial folks overseas that aren't very happy about this um, and are coming to a kicking and screaming and probably fighting it in many legal ways, too. So what, what, what's your defense when, uh, you know, the UK or someone says, wait a minute, this, this transaction origi originated here in London. You can't impose your regulations, Washington, on what we're doing over well, here. Well, actually, we, we've been on a journey together. Uh, from 2009, when President Obama got the leaders of 20 nations together in Pittsburgh, it was called the G20 Summit in Pittsburgh in 2009, and there was broad agreement on bringing new oversight to these once dark markets. And Europe, Canada, Japan, the U.S., we've been on this journey together. They've had very strong laws in place in Europe and in Japan and the U.S. We might be a little ahead on timing, and that creates some uh, 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 challenges because of different timing, uh, but we really are on this journey together. So the broad structure, you're in agreement. I know the devil's in the details, and that's where yes, this those is are a the market. gray areas, and the, but there's a lot of details um, and a lot of dust devils. So, so uh, uh, a fair review is that on uh, three or four areas, just we're smack on about the same place, and a couple of areas we're not. So reporting to regulators, meaning all of these transactions have to be reported to regulators. That's been going on in the U.S. since December of last year. $400 trillion of derivatives reported into the data repositories here in the U.S. Uh, as we speak. That there's something called central clearing that 
helps lower the risk of the marketplace. It's, an, it's been around for 120 years in other markets. We've just brought this common sense reform to the swaps market. In the U.S., we have phased it from March until this October, and it is now fully in place. And the last data we had was nearly three quarters of the transactions in the middle of September were being cleared in the interest rate markets. Europe will put that in place uh, sometime in the middle to second half of next year. So there's some timing difference. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we have what's called the risk mitigation techniques that, that the various dealers have to have uh, clean up their back office, the boring back office part of this, but swaps have to be documented, they have to be confirmed, they have to be reconciled. In all of those three areas, we're really uh, in sync. I would say the one area that is 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 been, um, we Americans have put in law and others have yet to join, is that the public benefits from transparency. And economists have shown, whether they're at Wharton or elsewhere, economists have shown for decades that transparency, price, and volume of transactions helps the broader public. It helps the 99 plus percent of the public that might use these tr contracts but it does shift some of the information advantage from Wall Street to Main Street. We've put that in place. We have post-trade reporting in the US. That means every transaction is reported now publicly. We're just initiating uh, that trading platforms as well have to be registered. Um, but as you might know, uh, Europe is only now passing a law to do that as well. And I think they will pass a strong law, but there are some uh, differences because we're about two years gap on the law. When that gap's closed, will there be um, incentives for some organizations to try to, let's say, originate, you know, outside of these 20 countries? And and you know, so there's always the argument with some regulation that well, if you if you regulate too much, then things just go underground and they become less transparent. But I mean, you're in September. You're saying you captured three quarters of the of the swaps in so, the U.S. So. <laughs> Can I go to uh, the Cayman Islands? Well, maybe that's a bad example because I know there were just some new rules passed there. But can I go to some other, you know, outside of these 20 countries and initiate my, my swap and avoid some of this paperwork? Well, risk knows no geographic border or boundary. So what we've done here in the U.S. is said if you're a U.S. person or if you're an overseas branch of that U.S. person, or you're an overseas affiliate that's guaranteed by the U.S. person, you're covered by these reforms. That only makes sense because we have to remember and recall the lessons of the crisis that so many of the U.S. banks uh, came asunder because of their offshore uh, enterprises in the Cayman Islands and elsewhere. If you want to set up in the Cayman Islands and you have nothing to do with the U.S., you're, you're by all rights, go ahead. But if you're guaranteed back here by the mothership in the U.S., your branch back here in the U.S., then you need to be covered. Sounds pretty, um, a, a, a pretty advanced state of global regulation, really. How would you compare that to what's happened in banking? Are, are you, are, are the two industries more or less, I know they're interrelated, but are, are they following parallel tracks, or, or do you think that this swap business is maybe a little bit ahead now? We've been very successful at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. We were given about 60 rules to write by Congress. That was three years ago. And uh, as we are here today, we've completed 61, in fact, rules, guidances, and orders. And for the last year, the markets have been coming into compliance. Uh, I'm very proud of all of the people at the CFTC. We've largely completed the task the president and Congress gave us. Um, that's partially true for bank regulation around the globe, but it's not uh, as far along in bank regulation. You've been quoted as saying <clears throat> that the CFTC is not going to allow the creation of another Enron loophole. <laughs> Could you tell us what you were referring to when you said that? Well, there, was, there were various reforms that Congress passed 13 years ago in a, in a different era. And as part of those reforms, uh, there was an allowance, an exemption 
for trading platforms from registration. I mean, think about it as that you could operate a, um, a restaurant or maybe, if you wish, a casino without having a proper license, without having to uh, allow inspectors to come into your restaurant or your casino. <laughs> And uh, that was all right. That's where Congress was in 2000. That came to be known as the Enron loophole, a uh, number of senators and congressmen, and even Senator Obama in June of 2008 put out a release saying that he felt that we should close this Enron loophole, that we should no longer have unlicensed restaurants or casinos in the swaps trading area. That's what Congress did. They repealed that exemption, and with rules that we completed that went into effect on October 2nd of this year, uh, now uh, if you want to trade on a trading platform, it has to not only have a license, but it has to have certain business conduct. It has to be uh, open to the whole broad public, not just to a select few. And um, uh, these reforms will really help promote transparency in our economy. You talked about a market of $400 trillion. Um, put that next to the entire U.S. economy, which is about $16 trillion. So it's a big number. Um, confronted with that, and you, one has to ask, like, how can you possibly regulate something so big and sprawling? What, what are some of the fundamental principles that you start out with when you do that? And how, how did you accomplish so, what you so did? So here's a market that actually is 25 times the size of our economy, the notional amount. The risk is, is not quite that big. So the fundamental principles, going back to basics, transparency matters. You can shift information from the few dealers to the broad public, and that makes an economy work better. That's true whether it's in automobiles where we now can go on the internet, we can see the price of automobiles before we go into the dealership. And it's as true and important in these swaps. So the mar market is your partner enforcer, in, in a way. Well, beyond that, that we promote economic activity and efficiency in markets, which is a fancy economic word saying that it costs you less if the market's transparent. Um, I have three daughters. And uh, they're young. I wouldn't give them the keys to the car if I didn't think there were rules of the road. That uh, years ago, uh, the state legislature passed laws to have traffic lights and stop signs and cops on the beat to insure against drunk drivers. I mean, I just wouldn't give my daughters the keys to the car. That's what we were doing in this swaps market. It was unregulated. And because of the crisis, Congress said no. We have to have common sense rules of the road for the big highways of finance the same way we might have for the back roads for my daughters. Uh, that's the basic principle. After they ran the tractor trailer off the road. <laughs> well, they did, if I yeah. might just pause yeah. there. So that's what we saw. AIG and others had fantastic accidents, and they took out the, the bystanders. So, so you could have been a pedestrian, so to speak, on the road, and you could have been one of eight million that lost your job, and having never heard of what a credit default swap. My, my mom, she's 86, she still asks me, Gary, what's a swap? <laughs> you know? yeah. so, so our job in Washington, and it's very different than when I once was uh, fortunate enough to work on Wall Street for many years, but our job is to look out for that broad public interest, transparency and lowering risk and ensuring against manipulation and fraud for the general public. You know, it's interesting that uh, with the uh, AIG bailout, which I think was something like $180 billion in the That's year. right. $600 for each and every American. And I know that... Um, I know that they've claimed it not that long ago that they, they paid it back with interest, and I know there's a lot of folks who say, but that, you know, that's miscounting or misaccounting. There's a lot of other costs that, that weren't added up in there, um, and that there was probably actually a direct loss to the taxpayer. But putting that controversy aside, what you mentioned um, is interesting, that 8 million jobs were lost. They were a big contributor to that. That's never on the ledgers. That's never counted. That's, 
that's separate and apart from you know the you know the 180 billion and we and they paid that back. Um, so just I mean it sounds like you're you're concerned about that and I, I find it interesting because you don't hear a lot of concern about that. Um, it tends to be you know about the debits and credits and it turns into a technical discussion a lot of times and the, the human side is lost. So. No, no, this is a very real human side. I mean, beyond the 8 million people that lost their jobs, I mean, millions uh, found themselves with homes that were valued less than their mortgages, and, and, and millions found their pension uh, and savings uh, lower. Hundreds of thousands of businesses didn't make their budget in 2008 and 2009. There's real live consequences uh, to the public from these uh, what might be considered otherwise sort of narrow part of the economy. Do you know that non-finance in our economy, the non-finance side, employs 94 percent of private sector jobs? And of the other 6 percent, most of that is insurance or community banks. Only a very small slice is what we might call Wall Street. But they produce more than 40 percent of the profits, I think. Well, but ultimately, ultimately, finance has got to serve the real economy. Finance is about what well, Wharton, it's studied. It's about allocating the money in society to the best uses so that my family's savings or your family's savings is allocated to another family that wants to take out a mortgage or somebody that has a good idea and wants to innovate and start a business. Finance is about serving the rest of the economy. And uh, these complex market swaps, uh, if well regulated, are a component of serving the rest of the economy but not taking down the rest of the economy. Right. And I cite the 40 percent uh, not so much to underline the importance of the industry. It's, of course, it's very important. But, but to also note there's many economists uh, and financial observers from across the spectrum who say that that's an imbalanced economy when you have that much of your economy based uh, in, in finance. Well, and, and in fact, economists will say if you bring efficiency to a market, you usually narrow the profit spread and can produce the same product for less cost. We all like it that our computers cost less today than they did three years ago or 10 years ago. Transparency in the swaps market will provide the risk reduction of swaps, for, but for a lower cost. One last question. Um, I hope it's not a hard one. Uh, I'm wondering, you, you're talking about regulating $400 trillion worth of swaps. I think you have about four employees working right now in your agency. We're right now under the government shutdown still. Um, you're the only financial regulator that's actually shut down, except for a few key people. Um, how does that work or not work? Well, the staff of the CFTC have proven themselves to be remarkably resilient. Uh, the 650 that were furloughed and have not come in, I thank them for their resilience of putting their uh, professional lives on hold and living with this uncertainty. For the 30 who have come in each day, 30. and um, each day we have an all-hands meeting and we get together to say, are you still here? We fit them in one room. <laughs> one room, one room, <laughs> and we go around, everybody talks. Um, I thank them as well. It, we're not doing anything other than a cursory review of markets at this point in time. This is not um, adequately overseeing the markets. And we're a gravely underfunded agency to start with. We're only about 5 percent bigger than we were 20 years ago, and that was before Congress gave us this new responsibility to oversee a $400 trillion market. So I, I wonder how many times bigger the market is. <laughs> Can you do that math? Well, we, we had over, overseen a market called the futures market, which historically was in corn and wheat and oil, but it also was in financial products like the euro dollar contract and the S&P 500. That total market was about $30 trillion. And Congress asked us to take on this other market 
this $400 trillion market. So you can see, and with that new responsibility, we don't have more people. There's one uh, other odd thing about that, I think, that I've come across, which is that I believe your agency was responsible for bringing in something like almost a billion dollars worth of fines. Is, is that correct? Over the last year or so? Well, it, it, in the heart of the 2008 crisis, what our agency, the CFTC, found is that large financial institutions, banks, were readily and pervasively rigging the interest rate market. There's something called the London Interbank Offer Rate, which is in many of your viewers' mortgages and student loans and, and uh, business loans. And that marketplace was being rigged by major banks. We've brought four actions, and you're right, collectively those four actions against uh, three big banks and one a broker have brought in, I think, over two, over two billion dollars to the U.S. Treasury. Somebody went back and they figured out that that added up to the last 17 years of our agency's funding. Well, maybe in the future you'll be able to get a small cut of that. <laughs> no, we don't. I, I, we're a good investment to the American public because you need cops on the road. You need somebody looking. We're also a good investment, I would contend, to Wall Street, though they don't always agree with what we do. Their brand is wrapped up in the confidence in the markets. Could you imagine, would anybody come to the football games on Sundays if there were no referees? I mean, for a week or two, it might be interesting, but after that, it would not. We need referees to uh, ensure that people have confidence in the markets. Thanks very much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you.